Hey, it is so good to see people in this room. Can I just, yeah, whoa, man. You have no idea how giddy um, and frustrating I've been to my wife and kids with just giddy and joy and glee knowing that we are going to be able to do live services again starting today. And thank you so much for being a part of this. We've got a great audience online as well, a great group on there. If you're in here, would you welcome them? Just tell them thanks for worshiping with us too. Wherever you're worshiping from, we are thrilled you're here. I got to admit, I'm just going to be honest with you though, full disclosure, these are my favorites right now. If you're online, I, I, no, I'm just kidding. We love you, but thank you so much. It's just, there is nothing like being able to worship together, do community together. I just love walking through the lobby and seeing half of the faces of people I haven't seen in a while. And it is just so good to worship. See your kids over there skipping, bouncing into classrooms and stuff. This is awesome. What a great uh, opportunity to start the new year together. Hey, every January, every year we start the first few weeks of the year uh, really looking at what might be called an own the vision type of a series. Uh, today we're calling a game on. It's like here's our values, our vision, what we're all about, kind of pull the playbook out again and remind us of who we are and why we do what we do together. And so uh, this is the beginning of game on over the next few weeks here. By the way, let me just state the obvious a little bit. It is a little bit risky um, to schedule a message series uh, that starts, that has football analogies and football language and graphics and stuff. Two days after, um, my beloved Fighting Irish get waxed by Alabama yet again. I'm just hurting and I don't like you. Whoever that was, I don't like you. I don't know who it is, but I don't like you. I had 11, 11 people within about 15 minutes of that game on Saturday text me after the game was over. Some of you were very nice. And comforting. Some of you are just jerks. Just, just, just <laughs> mean. Just rude. I love you anyway. In fact, uh, this person will remain unnamed, but somebody sent me this uh, picture via text. If we can bring that up, the Notre Dame picture. There we go. How Notre Dame fans see Notre Dame. Woo! How Alabama fans see Notre Dame. <laughs> Little Pee Wee League. That is not nice. That is not nice. It's not. Uh... I do want to point something out though. I'm a fan of this side because look at this, how Alabama sees. You see that apostrophe? That grammatically is incorrect, you Alabama nuts. You see, so you may know how to play football, but we can do grammar. So uh, anyway, so no, all, all that to say, it's a little risky doing a little football. Hey, man, I've been a Notre Dame fan for a lot of years. I'm used to this. Though. It's just how it is, right? But, uh, but we're going to just kind of game on and get ready to start this new year with a punch together. In fact, let me just take a quick survey, a little poll very scientific one here. Online, you can hands up, thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever you want. How many of you are so thrilled that 2020 is in the rearview mirror? Just a quick show of hands. You're glad it's over, yeah? Other show of hands. How many of you are sad by it? How many of you are like, no, I could have done some more of that. Anybody else in here? No? Let the record show there's not a hand in the room. That is unanimous. Put that in for approval. I think we all feel like that. In fact, we were actually joking a few weeks ago as we were getting ready for launching this series, launching the year together. Um, back in the 80s, I think it was, there was a guy named Gallagher. You guys know who Gallagher is? Remember him? Do you remember the name of his big hammer? The sledge Do you remember that? Okay, so if you know what I'm talking about, this guy named Gallagher would bring up these big watermelons on stage. His sledge we got a little uh, video of it just to show you quick what he would do. He would swing this thing and bam! We thought about doing that up here on the stage but for those of you who are about the first four or five or six rows, you're welcome because that would have been a nightmare, the disaster. We were going to bring a watermelon right 2020 on the front and let somebody come up, put some goggles on and just, we are done with you, but uh, decided not to. But that's how we all feel about it, don't we? 2020, put it back, put it in the rear view mirror. However, <laughs> every single one of us that drive, anytime we get into the car, you will recognize as I do, shut the door, put the keys in the ignition, you see your side mirrors. There is a little statement that is always on the side mirrors. In fact, when I looked it up this week, I understand they actually have to etch it in to the glass of every side mirror. It's, it's required by law now. And what does that statement say? Objects in mirror are closer than they appear. Dun, dun, dun. So we're excited that 2020 is over, but let me just tell you, there's still things that still exist. And I don't want to dampen the parade. I don't want to dampen or put water on the fire. There's joy at new and opportunity. Yes, I'm with you on that. And yet, we recognize there's still a broken world around us, isn't there? There's still a heck of a lot of work to be done. There's still a pandemic that we're trying to figure out how to navigate through. 
Vaccines, we're going to debate through whether they are or aren't something we should or shouldn't do. Masks, whether we should or shouldn't. Kids zooming and not zooming. School starting tomorrow and all that. On and on. There's an inauguration a few couple weeks away that there's so much political strife. And that's not just in our nation. That's globally. There's so much division and anger and angst and brokenness. There are so many people who made New Year's goals, New Year's resolutions, and here we are 48 hours into the new year and we've already broken them. Can somebody agree with me that you've already done that? I've done that. Please, somebody help me out. Nobody? Thank you. We got a couple people who have broken their New Year's resolutions. We're broken people. Just because 2020 is behind us doesn't mean that the objects of 2020 are not closer than they appear sometimes. And so we've got work to do. And, and there's, there's so much opportunity. 2021 feels so ripe with opportunity for the church to lead the way, for the church to be on the front lines, doing all we can to bring up there down here, bring hope to this fractured, messy, sledgematic, broken world that what 2020 has been. There's going to be pieces of that all over 2021 and beyond, but the church gets to be a part of the solution and bringing healing in that. And as we start this new year together, I've said from this platform before, I do not like making promises. I do not like making guarantees because, and I tell it to my kids and my wife, it's only because, man, it's so, I hate it when circumstances shift or human failure comes in the picture and a promise gets broken. I hate it. I want to know that, man, we're going to, I'm not going to fail somebody. I want to, I want to not let them down, but I'm going to make a guarantee this morning because the guarantee is not based on my words. It's based on his words, based on the roadmap, our, our scriptures. And I'm going to give you a guarantee that whatever you have planned for 2021, there is one thing that I believe the Bible makes abundantly clear all over the place that if you can do this one thing, you have positioned yourself to win. Conversely, if you, I can make another guarantee. If you don't do this same one thing, if you choose not to, you are destined to fail in 2021. And so I hope that intrigues you a little bit. I hope that's interesting to you. I've been encouraged by it myself. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 is where we're going to be this morning. By the way, as we're firing back up, please bring your Bibles with us. Uh, you'll notice in the racks in front of you, for those who are in the room here, we're not putting Bibles in because of uh, all the COVID stuff and all the restrictions. So bring your Bibles. This is our roadmap online. They'll drop the scriptures in there for you as well. But I hope your new year, I saw several at Mosaic talking about, hey, I'm going to read through the Bible this year. Or I just finished reading through the Bible in 2020. I love that. This is our roadmap. Not any other voice, not any other pundit, not any other social media platform. This is what guides us. In fact, it's one of our core values here at Mosaic that the Bible is our roadmap. <coughs> and what we mean by that is this. It's a core value that means in a world that is always, always changing, we build our lives on teaching that never does. We strive to help every single person understand and live in the power and freedom that the way of Jesus brings, that the way that this roadmap brings, there's no other voice, no other option out there that can bring that power and freedom and joy into your life than what God does through his word. So we're going to dive in deeper this year in some, in, in some areas. You're at Hebrews chapter 10 if you've got it. We're going to look at that in just a second. Before we do though, you don't have to turn there, but I just wanted to read something from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Over the uh, Christmas break, over the holiday, getting some extra time with the family, I had some extra time. I was just looking through some of the letters that Paul in the New Testament writes to Timothy and Titus, some of the people that he was discipling and mentoring. And man, I was recharged and re-energized by what I read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which you'll notice, I just want to read a couple verses. It's from one preacher to another preacher. Paul is writing it to Timothy. He's a pastor of a church, and he's trying to encourage him while he's been discouraged. But the, the truth and the, the points and the principles are applicable and transferable to all of this. So put yourself as the recipient. As we start 2021 together, put yourself as the recipient of this from Paul. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. In other words, he is king of kings, lord of lords. He's going to judge it all. And he's coming back. So here's what I'm telling you you need to do. Preach the word. Preach the word. And that word preach really carries the evangel evangelist or evangelizer is the same from the same Greek word. It's the idea of whatever you do, proclaim the gospel of Jesus. It doesn't just happen in a little six by six space up here on a platform. In word, in deed, online and off, you and I preach the word of Jesus. Be ready or be prepared in season and out of season to correct, to rebuke, to encourage how? With great patience and with careful instruction. 
For the time will come, see if this doesn't sound like today, the time will come when people will not put up with sound teaching or sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers or voices to say to them, they have itching ears and to say to them what they want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth. The truth will be right in front of them and they'll look away and they'll try to seek and channel surf and social media surf looking for the voices that'll speak what they want to hear, what their ears want to hear. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out for this. Uh, They will turn their ears away and they will not seek the truth. But you, and this is the line that has just stirred me, but you keep your head in all situations. A lot of us are acting like we've lost our head, lost our mind in 2020, didn't we? Keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, preach the word, and discharge all of the duties of your ministry. In other words, you perform what you were gifted and called and tasked to do. Preach the word, keep your heart in all situations, endure hardships. This isn't going to be easy. Do the work of an evangelist, tell the good news, and discharge all your duties in your ministry. Man, that is something you want a little bit of like a role or job description that I feel just compelled and propelled in going into 2021. It's right there. Would you hold me accountable to that? I mean that. If you look in there, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the first five verses, that's what my calling is. And that's what our calling needs to be, to be ready for whatever we're going to, to say, no, no, we're going to keep our heads on us. And we're going to give the truth over and over because our roadmap is where joy and freedom and life can be found. Let's do that together this year. That was all free. Um, That was just like a little Jeff devotional that I wanted to share with you, okay? But it does lead into what we're going to look at this morning. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, if you've got it. Let me give you a background a little bit on the book of Hebrews. Hebrews was written about 30 years-ish after Jesus walked on earth, after he had been executed, after he rose from the dead and went to heaven. So we're talking one lifetime. In other words, the recipients of this letter in the first century were Jewish Christians. People all around Jerusalem and Israel, all in that area, are receiving this letter to try to encourage and reguide them. People who their moms and dads, if not them, at least their grandparents, had probably seen Jesus, like physically with their eyes. Some of them may have been present at the crucifixion. Some of them may have seen Jesus physically walk after the resurrection. It's amazing, isn't it? And the stories, they knew the Bible. He is writing this to Jewish Christians, people who have put their faith in Jesus but are of Jewish descent. And they know the Bible, frankly, better than you and I. I mean, they lived and immersed themselves in the scriptures. They didn't have all the other things that we have today to distract them. So they knew the teachings. They knew the story of Jesus inside and out. And yet they're finding themselves really struggling in the faith. That's what the whole letter of Hebrews is all about. They're finding that being a Christian isn't easy. The world is very uncertain. The world is very complex. And they're even showing signs. When you read through Hebrews, you see that Paul is addressing what almost seems like boredom with Jesus. We can't relate to that at all, can we? I mean, we have tons of awe and wonder. When Christmas comes, we can't believe that. And Easter comes, we never get bored or distracted, do we? I think we can relate to this sometimes. They seem bored with the faith. They seem a little defeated by it. They seem like they've, they've lost their wonder. They've lost their focus, maybe even a little disenchanted with who Jesus is in Christianity. And they really just want to start abandoning it and go back to Judaism, which is a Jesus-free religion. It's almost like, um, remember the old REM song? Uh, that's me in the corner. That's me in the spot. Light. Losing my religion. Yeah, we know that song that came out years ago, right? That's kind of their anthem. Man, I I know the story. I got it. Man, I just, but I'm kind of bored with it now. A little bored with the Jesus sites. Too much work. The world is too complicated. There's too many questions that are unanswered. Let's just go back to the way things were before. And that's the audience that Jesus is writing to. And so here in Hebrews chapter 10, Jesus gives what I might say is like the locker room halftime talk for all time. Uh, the writer of Hebrews, if I said Jesus, I meant the writer of Hebrews gives this locker room halftime talk, like for all time, and and sets them straight and says, you're bored with this incredible, earth-shattering, eternity-bending story. Let me call you back to a few things. And so that just sets up what Hebrews is about in this passage. Let's look what he says in Hebrews 10, verse 12. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light. 
By the way, just to pause there, years ago, uh, man, I had on my wall in my office, I just lament that I can't find this picture. When I moved, I lost it somewhere. But there was a picture of this kid running down a dock, and he's just like leaping with all he's got into a lake. And it had on the side, it says, remember what it was like when you first gave your life to Jesus. And I, I feel that's what Paul's doing because I needed that reminder on my wall because I relate to this. Sometimes I forget that joy. I forget the wonder, the, I can't believe I'm part of this. I know what he caught me from, what he saved me from, what he's delivered me from. Yeah! Some days the days are just too muddy, too, too blurry, and I need reminded of that. That's what Paul, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's Paul that wrote this, but that's what the writer of Hebrews is telling these Jewish Christians right here. Remember when the light shined on you for the first time, the wonder and the awe of it, when you first saw the light of Jesus. Maybe you need to be reminded of that as we start the year. Remember that. Also remember when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were being treated that way. You're suffering along with those in pr- you suffered along with those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your own property. Why? Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions than what you had in front of them. My goodness, how we suffer for the cause of Jesus today, right? I mean, they were persecuted. They watched their friends, sometimes their family members, imprisoned, even executed. Everything that they owned sometimes was taken away. Why? Because they would not abandon the name of Jesus. They suffered it. But they remembered the joy and what had happened in their life so much so that Paul's reminding them, you were so changed by that. You knew the freedom that you willingly and joyfully paid that price. You paid the persecution yourself or you stood by side, side by side with friends and family who paid that. And you're like, it's worth it. He's worth it. You remember that? Mosaic, do we remember that? There's so many things that distract us and make it all murky. Do you remember the joy, the wonder, the I can't even walk into a church because I might get struck dead? Are you kidding? He welcomes me to the table and the awe of that. He knows my stories. He knows my skeletons, but he loves me in spite of that. The awe and the wonder of that. So much so that they were willing to pay a price. But now he's writing them because they've forgotten that. And they've gotten distracted and disillusioned a little bit. Here's what Paul says in the next verse there. uh, Verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For, and then the next two verses, a little interesting. He quotes a couple of Old Testament prophets. And uh, the first verse, it's from Isaiah. The second one is from Habakkuk. You need to persevere and hold on. Why? Because you're going to receive the promise. And here's the promises. In just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. He's coming back, y'all. And that is the thing that we anchor ourselves. Paul, the writer of Hebrews is saying, and what we would need to hear today is we don't anchor ourselves to our 401ks. We don't anchor ourselves to that vacation that we can't wait to get to. We don't anchor ourselves to a vaccine that comes back or getting that raise or that job promotion or whatever it is, or watching our kids succeed beyond us. That's not what we anchor ourselves to. Our hope is he's coming back. He is going to fulfill that promise. And not just that, but the next verse, and God says this through Habakkuk, but my righteous ones will live by faith. In the meantime, while you're waiting for me to come back, you live by faith. And here's the contrast. I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. All through this book of Hebrews, this letter to the people, Jesus is being, is the centerpiece, and the writer is reminding them over and over that no matter what you look for, you might feel like you get disillusioned, you might even feel like, how, how could it be, but you get bored with Jesus or bored with Christianity, there is nothing, nothing more life-giving, nothing better, nothing that sets you free like what you can find in Jesus. Don't you remember that? Did the stories and the circumstances and the challenges And the divisions all around you make you forget that, is what he's saying there. And I would say, church, Mosaic of 2021, did all the divisions and all the blurry mess of 2020 make us forget? Are you kidding? At the end, we're part of the most amazing story ever. It's incredible. When we walk through uh, Hebrews, we see this over and over. So, um, when is the last time, has anybody been in a stadium recently? 
Kind of a rhetorical question, right? Yeah. Let me remind you of what it's like to be in a stadium watching a basketball, baseball, football game because it's been a while, right? You go to a stadium and there's, you know, a big round and there's thousands and thousands of seats usually and there's maybe five, ten, a couple dozen players on the field. There where all the action is. They're doing all their stuff. But in the stand, there's thousands and thousands of people who are just, man, they paid some good dollars to show up to this, and they are loving the game. They're just enjoying the game. But there's usually like three people who you'll see in the stands. At least this is what I would say. First one is you got the experts. Get the guys who are munching on their popcorn, they're drinking whatever is in this cup. Um, Oh, this is a naughty crowd. That's great. Uh, no, they're, they're just enjoying the fruits of being at the game, and they're the experts. Sometimes we might call them the armchair quarterbacks, and, and they, they're the ones who they can tell you everything the quarterback or the head coach or the player should have done after the play's over. Oh, man, he should have called an audible. Oh, man, they should have run the ball. The defense was lined up differently. They should have passed this time. Head coach, what are you doing? The play calling on this. Come on, what's going on in the field? You've got so many people all around the stands that are doing, come on! Or they're, they're questioning the refs, on and on and on. And here's the thing about those guys, the experts and, and women, the armchair quarterbacks, most of them have never stepped foot on the field. But, man, they know how it ought to be done. So they're in the stands. Then you got some other people who are sitting there, and they're like the superstitious ones. They're, they're always worrying and fretting and fearing. Come on, team, come on. Okay, like, um, I got to wear my hat inside out, the rally cap, or if I wear, this is the same jersey I wear every time, and I've told my wife, don't you ever wash this jersey, because every time I wear it, they win. And they're worried, oh, come on, oh, he never hits this field goal, oh, it's going to be bad, I can't even watch. You got people like that in the stands, who, again, don't do anything to contribute to the outcome, but they feel emotionally invested, even though they've never been on the field, and they don't contribute to it. And then there's this third category. It's, I, I would just call them the casual fan, the casual observer. It's ball game. I mean, or the crowd can be raucous around them. Things, guys are blood, sweat, and tear, just doing everything on the field. They're on their phone. They're just kind of strolling through whatever the stock market's doing today or the updates on social media or looking at the clock. What's the time? Hey, babe, where are we going to go to dinner after the game? What's going on? Hey, did I tell you that uh, Susie called about whatever? And, what, and they're just so disconnected to what's happening there. They paid good dollars to show up and kind of consider them part of it. But they're not engaged at all in what's really happening on the field. Oh, did we win? Did we lose? Okay, cool. Uh, we'll see you next week. I mean, they're just so not engaged in it. Three different kind of people. The experts, the, the, uh, the worried ones who are kind of superstitious about it all, worrying like crazy, and those who are just really casual. And they're all sitting in the stands because this feels a lot safer and a lot more comfortable and a lot more predictable than, man, what's happening on the field down there. Although, it was funny, I was reading a story this week preparing for this. Back in uh, about eight or ten years ago in Kansas City, there was a game, true story, there was a mascot. It was one of those promotion days where the mascots were throwing out stuff into the crowd and he was throwing free hot dogs out to fans. So in between uh, different stoppages in the game, throwing hot dogs around. No kidding, there's video of this. He's behind the back, lobbing hot dogs. This is the throw. The guy, casual observer, is on his phone, looks up at the scoreboard for a second. The hot dog in its tinfoil hits him in the side of the eye, detaches his retina, and it's still in the courts. Like eight or ten years later, he's suing the team for this all, which is, it proves two points. Number one, mom was right when she said hot dogs were not good for us. (laughs) See, it's true. She was right. She knew what she was talking about. More importantly, though, there's no safe place in this game, is there? I mean, it may feel more predictable and may safe, and statistically speaking, that's where the danger is, but that's where the life is, that's where the action is, and people sitting on the side are missing it. 2020 has, um, to be honest, kicked our butts, a lot of us, didn't it? It put a lot of us on the sidelines. A lot of us on the sideline as critics, a lot of us on the sideline as people just worry and fretting and, oh, what's going to happen? A lot of us just kind of like became very blayes and casual about our faith. I think 2020, there was so much loss in 2020, incredible loss of life due to a virus. Wherever you land on that politically, I'm not trying to make that a political statement, but there's been a lot of loss. A lot of Christmas tables look very different this year. Uh, There was a lot of loss of employment. As you sit here, many of you are being affected by that because of family members or even yourself, either loss of employment or reduction of employment. Mental health has been all over. I mean, it's just, what a hard year. There's been so much loss in 2020. If you'll allow me from a spiritual standpoint, can I tell you what I believe is the greatest loss of 2020? At least in the church. I think the church lost its focus. And I'll stand here and I'll tell you, I've been part of that. I think the enemy has been so crafty 
and so distracting that we lost our focus for so many reasons that we took ourselves off the field and out of the game. And whether it was, you know, uh, fear or whether it was, I'm going to tell the world how they need to fix it, or I'm going to tell everybody else how they need to do it, or whether I was just distracted and worried about other things and my spiritual life went on the back burner. I just, I, I think one of the greatest things that we lost in 2020 was focus. As a church, like Little C Church Mosaic, but also Big C Church, the church at large, I think we lost intensity. I think we lost passion. I think we lost awe and wonder at the fact that we get to be a part of this incredible story. I think we lost ownership, realizing that God called me to be a part of his plan. Me? Man, I want to be a part of that in a way that is transforming. I think we've lost much of that. I think we did what we see the people in Hebrews 10 doing. I think they lost some of those things. And and, um, that's me in the corner losing my religion. I think, and Jesus is not a religion. Don't let me be blurred by that. Jesus is a relationship. But I think we lost all the intensity and focus just like that. So you've been waiting on the edge of your seat. What's the one thing? What's the guarantee that I can win this year? That I can just feel that joy, that rush of lifting the trophy, spiking the football in the end zone, that I can be a part of that versus I am doomed to failure. What's the one thing? What's the game changer? It was actually in the text. Hebrews 10, look at verse 36 and 38 with me. Hebrews 10, 36 and 38, if we can bring that up. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. My righteous ones will live by faith. I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Persevering and you will receive. Persevering and you will win. What is the one thing? I can boil it down to this. The one thing is suit up and run. Suit up and run. That is the one thing that makes or breaks your year. I believe I didn't get to play football in high school because when I was like a sophomore in high school, I was about 108 pounds at, uh, I was about six foot, six foot one. 108 pounds. My parents were afraid I was going to be broken in half if I played. I, I appreciate that. I'm still, I'm a little bit over 108 pounds now, so, but this feels good to have this on. But you have to understand what I'm trying to say is suit up and run. What you have to understand that the author is saying, it boils down to this. You have to persevere no matter what you face, no matter what in the rear view mirror, the objects that seem closer than they appear, all that that we're going through. You've got to suit up and you've got to get on the field and stay on the field. If you do that, you win. Seriously, and I'm going to show you that in just a second. If you don't do that, you have no chance of winning, no hope in it. You stay over here because of fear, because you know it all, because you're too casual and you really are blies and don't care, because you're too much Hebrews 10, kind of bored with it, kind of disenchanted with it. You stay over here, you lose, guaranteed. But you are not built for that. God did not breathe his life into you, his image into you, so that you could be a seat warmer, so you could be some version of an armchair quarterback trying to tell everybody else how to do it but never touch the field. God did not build you for fear or for defeat or for despair. God did not build you for some pedestrian, casual, sterile version of life or faith. God built you to get on the field, suit up and run. Armor, armor is talked about in Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the armor of God. Make no mistake about it. The scripture makes it clear. It's a battle. It's a fight. It's in the trenches, lining up against the enemy. And you can't do that casually. You can't do that from the stands. Guaranteed win. Get your butt off the seat and on the field. Suit up and run. You weren't made for those things. You were made to be a warrior. You were made to be somebody who takes your story and your talents and your gifts and your experience and you choose to master and own whatever role God gives you in this thing called the spiritual family of God. He uniquely wired you, uniquely suits you up to play in the game, to play in the battle. Suit up and run. Don't sit. Suit up and run. You are called and our calling is to press forward to, yes, get our jersey dirty to maybe get injured every once in a while, to maybe feel the bruises, feel the hurt, feel the pain, feel the cost, to lay it all on the field, to throw up every once in a while because it costs so much. But that's what we're called to do because that's what was modeled for us. You were called not to whimper and whine and complain on the sidelines. You were called to line up against the enemy, look him square in the eye, punch him in the mouth, and let him know that the gates of hell do not stand against the followers of Jesus. 
Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can do all things through Christ. Suit up and run, church. Suit up and run. It's, what, it's the game changer for you this year. You can try every diet. You can try every reading plan. You can do whatever you want. You don't get yourself suited up with the armor of God and make full commitment to get on the field and run like he's wired you to run. You don't win. You weren't guaranteed this was going to be easy. You weren't, going to, you weren't guaranteed this wouldn't be, that this would be struggle-free. You weren't guaranteed you wouldn't get hurt in this. I'll tell you what you were guaranteed. You're on the victorious team. You're on the team that wins because it's not your team or my team. It's his team. And he is the one that is the victor ultimately. Suit up and run. That is the game changer for you this year. That is the game changer. Any of you seen um, the movie Ben-Hur? You know, I'm talking about the 1959. Let me see if I can get this off of this mic. The 1959 movie Ben-Hur. How many of you seen that? You know, I'm talking about Charlton Heston. Yeah, some of you. We're dating ourselves. I honestly haven't seen it through. I've seen most of it, but it's one of those movies that it's hard to watch the whole thing through. It's three hours and all that. Big epic, though. And in this movie, Charleston Heston plays Judah Ben-Hur, who is, it, it's really a fascinating, very faith-oriented movie, but he is um, going to be in this climactic, epic scene towards the end of the movie where there's this big chariot race, if you know what I'm talking about. I mean, this is the thing. This former slave is going to chariot race against a, a noble, a royalty. And um, in producing the movie, the director, his name was William Wyler. William Wyler was the director of Ben-Hur, won an Academy Award for this and everything. He talked to Heston. He said, here, I think the most authentic, real thing for the audience to experience is not for us to put a stunt double in, but for you to ride the chariot, for you to steer the chariot, for you to run this in the race. And Heston totally agreed. But that would require a lot of work. I'll give you a picture. It's a screenshot from the movie. And we're talking a four-horse chariot. So as you can imagine, they have to learn his voice, he has to learn the technique, steering the chariot, all that kind of stuff, that they would be under his command. So for weeks and weeks, Heston did the work to learn how to do all of this. And it's just a few days before the shoot that they're going to shoot this climactic, epic scene. And Heston walks into Weiler, the director, and he says this, I think I can drive the chariot all right now, but I'm not at all sure I can actually win the race. Here's what the director, verbatim, here's what the director said back, Heston you just stay in the race, and I'll make sure you win. You just stay in the race, and I'll make sure you win. Suit up and run, and I guarantee you're a victor. That would be what God would tell us. You just stay in the race. You just stay faithful. In fact, it reminds me, there's a parable, a story that Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 25, He's talking about the rich uh, ruler, and, and, and he gave the, the talents, and he says, he comes back, and he says to his servant, well done, if you know it, well done, good, and, I, no, you said it wrong. You said, I, I was looking for successful. Well done, good, and, it's not successful, is it? It's not successful that we're chasing after. Well done, good, and faithful servant, faithful servant. Me putting on the armor of God, I cannot guarantee that I will win. I can only deliver on whether I will be faithful or not. I can only deliver on whether I'm going to get my 18 inches off of this seat and move over here and put the popcorn down and get on where the action is and suit up and live where God, with every breath and every heartbeat that I've got centered on Jesus, doing what I can to tell the enemy he doesn't have a chance. Our team has already won. That's all I can do. I can just be faithful to that. He takes care of the victory. You just stay in the race. I'll make sure you win. Suit up and run. Maybe you just need to hear that today. Because, man, I did. As I was reading through, as I was preparing for this year, I needed to be reminded that it's not about what I do or what I can accomplish. It's not about well done, good, and successful, Jeff. It's well done, good, and faithful. That is what I will be graded on. That is what each of us who claim to center ourselves on Jesus will be graded on. Well done, good and faithful servant. I so wish I had time to explain this, but you go through the New Testament, you look up that word faithful in the Greek. It's pistos, is the Greek word. Pistos is also translated in different places in the New Testament as believe or believer. So like when Jesus is talking to Thomas, Thomas doubting Thomas after the resurrection, he's like, Thomas, put your finger in my hand, put your nail on my side, you can see my scars, stop doubting and believe. 
That word believe in the Greek is pistos, same word as faithful. In other words, belief and faithfulness are completely tied together in the economy of God. Don't you sit on the sideline and claim to be a believer in something that you're not going to be faithful to, is what the scripture is telling you. His word's not mine. Don't sit over here and be a critic. Don't, be a, don't you be casual about something that he gave everything for, that he, called, he gives you the armor, to get, he gives you the guaranteed win. Suit up and run. Don't be casual about something like that. Faithfulness and belief are completely connected in the economy of God. Um, last thought. I, I was, uh, we were driving back from Utah. We went to uh, Utah for a few days for Christmas as a family. Uh, theaters were open, restaurants were open. <laughs> So it was nice to be able to get out a little bit. Numbers are a lot lower over there for everything. So just a few days of rest for the family and loved it. On the way back, driving through Wyoming, desolate. You ever driven through Wyoming? Forget it. It just didn't even exist, right? It's like you and the tumbleweeds. I mean, there was nothing out there. So the kids are sleeping. A little bit of snow starts to fall in. And I did the thing you're not supposed to do. I put my AirPods in and I'm driving down the interstate. Again, it's just tumbleweeds. There's not a whole lot. Anyway, blaring some worship music. I'm just like, man, I need my heart, my soul filled. So I just started listening. There's two songs in particular that are just feeding my soul like crazy right now, just being honest. And I hope if you're online, stay with us after the service is over, or at at the end of the service, we're actually going to sing one of the two that are just filling my soul right now. And so I'm listening to these, I mean, on full volume, just deafening myself almost, just loving it. I'm raptured by yes, yes, yes. Leslie's asleep, kids are asleep. All of a sudden, something just hits me. I turn the music off. Me and the windshield, I'm looking forward. I said three words. God, I suck. (laughs) I've just been worshiping, just so filled with this. Something hits my head, hits my brain. I'm like, God, I suck. And if that's off-putting, I don't intend it to be, but that's, that's, that's my raw moment of I started reflecting. I look over at this bride that I can't believe God gave me, and I'm faithful as can be to her. Please don't hear that. But how can I love her better? How can I feel like I suck as a husband? I feel like I suck as a dad as I look in my rearview mirror, looking at my kids and trying to navigate them through different ages and seasons of their life. I feel like I suck as a pastor. I mean this. I'm just, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, gosh, I, how many times? And I mean, the enemy is so good at like, like, a, like the snowflakes hitting the windshield, just like a flood of, you missed the mark here, wrong decision there, you upset that person. That per- and just on and on. I'm just like, God, I'm terrible. I don't know what I do with I feel like I, I suck at leading our staff. I, I just don't know. I don't feel like, I don't, I just, ah, I just, I've got neighbors that I love and I suck at being Jesus to them. I don't know. I just, I'm just sitting here. I mean, I'm not telling, it was just this moment where I just been listening to this worship that was filling my soul and like something just, I like I had hit a wall. It hit me. And um, so I probably 10, 15 minutes of just wallowing in whatever that joy is. Um, Next exit we get to, wife, kid, Leslie, kids are waking up, you know, got to get some more fuel and all that kind of stuff. We stop, we go into the rest stop, or uh, the restroom in the bathroom. I come out, I'm out before everybody else. I get my phone out. And um, we had a friend who just uh, passed away a few years, a few weeks ago, I'm sorry, uh, back in Indiana. His name Mark Beeson, one of the pastors that just shaped my life, shaped my ministry. Love that man. After battling for about 10, 11 months with pancreatic cancer, just brutal. Um, he, he died, uh, I think it was December 12th or 13th. Um, and just two weeks prior to his death, their church was doing similar to what we had done, like Advent devotionals, Christmas devotionals. And Mark was recorded about two weeks before his death, doing the last video recording that they had of him. And it was put on the stream on there that, hey, maybe this will encourage. So here I am standing in some unnamed rest, uh, gas station, uh, in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, and I'm strolling and I see that and I see it's about Mark and I play it. And, um, so Mark, Mark was so, is, is so physically gone, cancer just eats your body up, that they shot the video kind of from an angle where he's just holding his Bible and starts talking. And um, this is the verse that was his devotion. It's Isaiah 41.10. Mind you, I'm coming back from, I suck. I got nothing to offer. I just, I'm, I'm, I missed the mark on everything. And Mark is doing this devotion. And, and by the way, as you're reading this, but his Bible is here and Mark says, I'm 67 years old following Jesus for 40 something years, whatever he said, and he starts to cry. You don't see it. You can hear him start to cry. He's like, and he starts thumping his Bible. And I've been battling pancreatic cancer for 10, 11 months now. And I don't know what my future holds, but here's what I can tell you that I do know. This is what I anchor myself to. And he reads this verse, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. 
I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And crappy, I suck in the moment. Jeff is just sitting there and I got tears rolling down in this gas station in the middle of nowhere as I'm reminded, I do suck. It's not about me. There's this weird paradox that anything that I can offer, Isaiah, actually in a different place, will tell me anything that I can offer is filthy rags. He doesn't want it. He doesn't say, go put your own armor on. You put my armor on. He doesn't say, get on the field with your own strength. He says, I will be with you. I will strengthen you with my arm. I will take care of you. You get on the field. You suit up and you run, and I will guarantee that you win. Stay in the race. I'll make sure you win. And it was just uh, one of those catalytic moments for me. I just was like, again, rejoicing. And I, all the scriptures that started flowing, greater is he that is in me. I am more than conquerors. What can we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? The gates of hell will not prevail against us. I just kept going through those verses as we got in the car. I may have been driving a little bit above the speed limit at this point because I was so lit up, so energized by being reminded that I am not the source of the strength I, can, I don't have to have it all right. All I got to do is suit up. All I got to do is run. Run for what God called me to do. Run a Jesus-centered life. Run with every beat of my heart, every breath of my lungs. Run in church. That's what we do. That's what we're called to. And if you do that, you're guaranteed the win. You were not guaranteed this would be easy. You were not guaranteed your jersey isn't going to get mud on it. You were not guaranteed that there's not going to be people with their butts on the seat in the stands criticizing you, mocking you, maybe even friends making fun or ridiculing or telling you how you're doing it wrong. You ignore that nonsense and you suit up and you run because you are guaranteed to win because you're on his team. You're not guaranteed this isn't going to hurt. You're guaranteed to be victorious.